And I want to do a special thank you to Jeff Smith. I went to his office yesterday. He loaned me this contraption here. This is awesome. So he uses this for his company, Catapult Healthcare, and it has three cellular modems in it. Right now, two of them are working, AT&T and Verizon. And then it's connected to a Linksys Wi-Fi router. At one point, Linksys had an open source version of their software, and then they changed it, went back to the proprietary. But that open source, Jeff got hold of, modified it so that this Wi-Fi router can talk to these uh, cellular devices. So he bypasses the local Wi-Fi systems. This box goes out with uh, nurses that go on to campuses, uh, uh, com company campuses, and they do on-site healthcare uh, assessments, blood work, and all this kind of stuff. And all these devices talk back Wi-Fi to this device, get uploaded via cellular, then uh, get analyzed, and the information sent back down to the nurses on-site. It's an awesome way to improve our healthcare system, automate things, and integrate our testing systems and whatnot. So he loaned this to me so that I can let my base station talk through this and the, uh, the, the uh, our computer systems to talk and see the, the unit cloud. I'll talk more about this in a moment. Uh, so let me get started in the presentation. Uh, and we got everybody right that. Uh, you didn't introduce yourself. Oh, I well, then. <laughs> I'm Ed Hightower. I think everybody me. knows me. <laughs> I've been in this uh, in the telecom portal for over 30 years now. I've been part of the Tech Titans since '98. Mike uh, and I used to run the software uh, software roundtable uh, many years ago, along with Pete Foreman. So the three of us uh, have been together and, and uh, causing trouble for a long time. And I love this community here. It was the telecom corridor and the telecom world that I uh, got involved in up here, and I love these are my people. My wife says. And so when I talk to my family about anything I'm doing, I have 30 seconds to tell them what I'm doing, and their eyes glaze over, and they're looking for a way to get out of the conversation. <laughs> when I come here, as you can see this morning, I got here 30 seconds before Paul Peck and, uh, and Mike came walking to the door. Uh, and before 7 o'clock. So this is exciting uh, industry to be in, exciting part of time to be uh, involved in this sort of thing. So I want to share, I'm a wireless guy, and so I've been keeping up with the low power wide area networks. Maria Breckenridge got me started. Uh, uh, five years ago, I started research, just almost five, I was researching about uh, a new wireless protocol called Weightless, and now it's called Weightless W. And it was a low power uh, wide area network protocol over the TV white space frequencies. And uh, I mentioned it to, to Maria, and I said, with well, the guys, the engineers at IEEE would like me to come and talk to them about it sometime, I'd be glad to do it. And uh, she called me up a couple days later, she would like to pick you up on the offer. I said, well, how many months out do I have to prepare my presentation? She goes, eight days. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, holy cow, I got all this, I got all this knowledge, but I got to put it in a paper and I'll press off somehow. Well, I reached out to Dr. William Webb, who is in the UK that runs the Weightless Special Interest Group, the SIG Group, and I said, can you help? And he said, sure. He sent me his uh, couple slide presentations. He had his marketing team, Matthew Bailey, uh, uh, contact me and everything. They gave me all this information for eight days. and worked 16-hour days, put it together. Hands uh, uh, sweating, had 100 engineers in the room, and made my first presentation. Well, that's put me on this path now for the last five years of talking about low power winds every couple of months to some group. In fact, I just did uh, see, uh, it's an IEEE Communications Vehicle Technology Group, the CVT group, this last Tuesday. And I'll be, I'm now the track chair for the IOT, uh, for the IEEE Metrocon Conference. It's going to be in Arlington. This is the IEEE in Fort Worth. They have their once a year uh, program, Metrocon, in Arlington next Thursday. So Jeff Smith will be one of my, one of the speakers, and uh, uh, Karen Kelly will be another speaker there. And then, uh, a replacement for Vikram Agia for TI will talk about uh, IoT and the things he's doing for vision for uh, telecommunications, uh, automated autonomous cars. And the plenary speaker is uh, McNair, Mike McNair from Bell Helicopter, who is in from UTA, helped Uber create the Uber Lift, Uber Elevate program, which is the electric vertical takeoff and landing. Uh, Autonomous flying car uh, program. He's going to be the plenary speaker. I got him to, to uh, come and do that. So anyway, this is exciting time to be a part of this industry and what, what's going on in our community. So, uh, I'm recording this. Hopefully, it'll turn out. I'll try to edit it and upload it to Vimeo and then connect it to my LinkedIn profile. 
Uh, so hopefully in a week or so you'll be able to, to go and look back on this if you, if you want to look at anything particular. I want to give credit to all of the researchers and analysts that are out there. There's a lot of great stuff on Google, and uh, so it's a great place to, to go. Be sure to vet everything that you read, uh, but uh, awesome information. So there's a lot of complex definitions of the Internet of Things. I like this one. It's, it's mine. It's about remotely monitoring and controlling objects and devices in the field. You bring that information in, you analyze it, and you do something with it. That's all the Internet of Things is about. What you're doing is adding uh, technology in every, along, every element along the way. So I break it down, and the Internet of Things is three parts to me. You got the devices in the field, which can also be edge processing, and a lot of microprocessing capabilities at the edge, at the end, at the end devices. Then you got whatever connectivity you need, and then on the back end, what a rich environment you've got there: computer systems, and cloud, and analytics, and all kinds of technology on the back end. But being a wireless guy, I focus on the radio, the wireless connectivity part. Of it. Now, in the old days. That connectivity was other things as well. It could have been a wireline, it could be microwave, it could be a, a private radio or cellular. Particularly 2G was really good for machine-to-machine uh, -machine type of communications. And then for short-range kind of things, you did uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and uh, mesh and that kind of thing. And then for large areas, satellite was good. So you can't read this very well. I'm sorry at, uh, what it is. But, but LP WAN is in a, in a very unique space. So your X axis talks about range. Your Y axis talks about uh, bandwidth. And so LP WAN is very low on bandwidth, but it's good in range. And that also is about saving power. We'll talk about that more in a moment. On the left hand bottom corner, you've got all your short range technologies, Bluetooth, Wi Fi, and all. And then you've got other uh, newer technologies coming online to give you more range and more bandwidth. Uh, and then you get the cellular different type of versions 2G, 3G, etc., on up. And whatever 5G is going to be. So I'm going, uh, there's a lot of players out there, more coming all the time, a lot of new approaches to low power wide area networks. So to define what a low power wide area network is, uh, it's got to be relatively long range, it's got to be low power so it saves the battery. The idea is to try to be able to put devices in the field that last five, at least five years, or hopefully ten years, so that you can put them in places where you don't have to go back to. A lot of these sensors need to go in hostile environments, and you don't want to go back and visit those things uh, for 10 years, you can help it. And of course, in 10 years, the technology will change as well, so you may want to replace them, but not until that time. The uh, other thing about low power wide area networks is you want to lower the cost, the infrastructure cost, so that you can pass that savings on to uh, the, the uh, users of this, this uh, technology. The present infrastructure that we have out there for cellular is aimed at supporting our smartphones. And so that infrastructure cost is difficult to translate into low power uh, or low cost uh, systems, or uh, uh, low power wise, not modern systems. They're working on it. I'll talk more about that in a moment. They've got their challenges. Uh, the system also needs to be very scalable. And that's um, a real challenge, too, in some of these uh, approaches that uh, the low power wind guys have uh, taken. I'll get into that more in a moment. And the other thing, there's two kinds of mobility that we're talking about here. The one which most of them can and do support is that you have a device in one network somewhere, you need to take that device out and move it to a network somewhere else. That device needs to be able to register to that new network without having to have a physical uh, intervention. That's ideal. The other is truly mobile. You have a device that's moving along, so you've got a supply chain, you got a truck, you got a, a cargo thing that's moving along, you want to be keep up with it along the way. Uh, some systems support that, some of these systems don't, but it would be nice to have that in some cases. And then it needs to be reliable, and that's a real tricky part uh, in some cases, being able to, to provide reliable communications at unlicensed frequencies. But we'll talk about more about that in a moment, because there's ways to do it. So, there's places for all these technologies to play. The blue, in this case, for the cellular, is the very short uh, uh, stats over there. They're going to have great applications for autonomous cars, for high bandwidth applications, and for low latency type of applications. So they're going to definitely have a place to play. But they're always going to be power hungry, and they're going to be uh, the IoT applications are going to be kind of second, second fiddle, if you will, to smartphone support. So smartphones I always have the priority. Then uh, the magenta. Purple, whatever that color is, for low power, that's uh, Wi-Fi uh, wi and Bluetooth kind of deals. 
if you're inside of a building or a, a relatively short area that you're trying to cover, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and Bluetooth 5.0 and those kinds of mesh are all very good technologies for that kind of uh, application. But what they found, the researchers have seen that anywhere between 60 and 80 percent of IoT applications will be satisfied with low power WAN type technology. And in fact, uh, some analysts have saying that 86 percent of all the IoT applications out there require less than three megabytes per month per device. Three megabytes. If you look here close over the, that big uh, uh, camera on the left, that 76 percent require one megabyte or less per month. So 70 percent, 76 percent of all the applications out there, one megabyte, you don't need a lot of bandwidth, and most of these applications are not worried about latency. So you can have a little bit of latency and be a, be okay. And that's what the low power WAN systems optimize their communications to enable. So I'm going to break down and talk about five examples. Uh, the first example are the Sigfox and N-Wave guys. It's ultra uh, narrow band and uh, one way uh, by choice or by design. And then the Ingenue, which is a, a very unique kind of a, a technology, wide uh, spread spectrum and the 2.4 gigahertz range. Then uh, you got Seth. Oh, yeah, one doesn't show up, does it? Oh, okay. So, on the... We're not going to talk about that, then, are we? Yeah, no, we <laughs> move right on. So... So... What was I talking about? Uh, you got to go for a couple. Yeah, one yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the cellular guys, they have five different protocols. We're going to focus on two. LTE, LTE M, which is also called LTE CAT M1, or EMTC. <laughs> so anyway, I'm, we're going to go with LTE M, uh, and then NB IoT, narrowband IoT, which is the closest version to our low power wind systems that, are, that you recognize when you talk about Sigfox and Laura and, and uh, Weightless and all. Then we're going to talk about uh, Laura for a few moments, and then we'll talk about Weightless uh, and the new product that uh, Ubic is manufacturing and, and shipping. So. This just shows that all these five different types of technologies, some can be in licensed frequencies, the cellular guys, uh, and uh, uh, weightless can actually go in site uh, to license. Some guys can go unlicensed and be private networks, Laura and weightless. Uh, and some people can be in unlicensed but do a public network. So they're trying, like Ingenue and Sigfox are creating networks, like a cellular network, but dedicated to, to machines. And in their cases, they're trying, both those companies, Sigfox and Ingenue, are building worldwide networks out there, which is a big challenge. We'll talk about that more in a moment. And then Laura is, uh, can, is a building block. It can be used to do private networks, public networks. Senate is trying to create a, a public network with, it, with their technology. So Sigfox, this is, um, have been around a long time. They are the first gener a first generation uh, low power wind technology. They are one way by design. There's a very basic technology. They uh, took this technology and ran, came to the market and have done a great job at marketing. They've got a huge following, a lot of good support uh, in the industry. Uh, they're trying to build out this, next, this worldwide network. And they don't control it. They are licensing the technology to people that have infrastructure or resources in various countries. And they license the technology, and those companies then install and implement the Sigfox uh, network. But this, the, the protocol, when a device has an event and it needs to transmit, it just wakes up, transmits three times with the highest power, doesn't listen to anything else. It might or might not get through. There's no feedback loop, so there's no confirmation that the message got through. So as the networks get filled and the radio environment becomes more uh, congested, then they're going to have more and more problems. So right now it works great in a lot of applications. We have to wait and see if it's going to be applicable for as many use cases as they're hoping. They were hoping 70 to 90 percent of applications, use cases, could be satisfied with Sigfox. A lot of people are saying it's 10 percent. So we have to wait and see. Uh, they got a lot of traction, uh, a lot of people are trying to work with their technology, and uh, it's great for simple things where you're doing monitoring of uh, meters and things, and if you get a reading once in a while, you're 
uh, basically one way, minimal uh, security capabilities um, and limited in the uh, use cases that will be. Now in Wave, Paul Peck and, and uh, Alan have done a great job at promoting this and uh, theirs is a one way by design but that's what they, they want it to be. It could be two way if they want it to, but they want to maximize the range. They found a very good niche in the parking industry. So they've done a great job of building that uh, relationship, uh, the re relationships in those areas. And uh, they are uh, got a, a real good map layer uh, that they work with. <coughs> and uh, uh, it's just a very good technology for those kinds of applications. We're trying to be able to sense something in the area and get its maximum range so you have the least amount of base stations in the area. Um, Great for sensor networks, good coverage. Uh, it's an open standard. So in wave right now is producing. Other people could produce it if they wanted to. Uh, they don't do so downlink. They are slow, but that's okay for their particular applications. Um, so it's a it's a good technology for what it's doing. So the difference is there's basically two approaches in a general way of how low power winds are created, the technology behind them. So the spike in the middle represents ultra narrow band or narrow band. So when you're transmitting at a narrow band or ultra narrow band system, you're putting all your energy in a narrow part of the spectrum and giving it the maximum amount of power in that area. So you can punch through and get as much range as possible. The bell curve, and that's uh, Sigfox and N-Wave uh, and Wakeness. The bell curve is spread spectrum. And that's like Qualcomm's technology, you're spreading your signal out over a large area of the spectrum. And it's actually below the noise floor. It's in the noise, but it's like us whispering in a room. If you're listening for that person's voice, you know the characteristics of their voice, you can pick it out. That's what they're doing here. They're picking out the signal out of the noise and reconstructing it, reconstructing it the other end. So Ingenu and Laura use the spread spectrum technique. And I'll talk about more of that in a moment. So Ingenu, I worked with those guys for almost a year. Uh, great technology. They spent 300 person years testing, evaluating, and creating the end product before they ever went to, to market with it. And that San Diego Gas and Electric was their partner uh, for that. And uh, they went through many iterations. They used an ASIC to control. There's a lot of math involved when you do, uh, when you do spread spectrum. Uh, and you're trying to maximize the battery, length, uh, uh, battery life. Uh, so you've got to really uh, minimize the amount of transmission power and the length of time to transmit those kinds of things to, to get the 10 years worth of battery. And so uh, they're trying to build out a worldwide network. They're more focusing on the United States and then they're licensing out other countries to be able to build that. They've uh, run into challenges because their CEO was let go in June of this year, John Horn. And uh, it looks like they're reorganizing. So they may go back to the model of instead of building out public network, they may go back to private networks for about. I don't know, we'll have to wait and see. They have 38 private networks, and WellAware was the first one that, that went out there. And so uh, it's great technology, it works very good. Uh, the business model is their challenge. Um, and it works in the 2.4 gigahertz range. Everybody knows it doesn't go very far. But they use diversity antennas to make up the difference right there. Uh, you get uh, 90 dB loss between sub gigahertz and 2.4 by adding a second antenna, diversity antenna, to your system. Now you regain that with 8 dB of, of gain back. Uh, and then they use all these uh, ASIC and robust protocol ways of being able to uh, enhance the signal. Basically. So very good technology. Business, uh, challenge your business plan. Cellular. Now these guys, they've got five different standards at least out there for the low power or for the machine-to-machine -machine communication system. The one that everybody knows about is 2G, GPRS. That's been around a long time, but they're taking those networks down. So to replace that, they've come out and AT&T and Verizon, I'll, I'll, I'll show that in one. Many companies have come out with LTEM or CAT M1 or E. Electronic Machine Type Communications is what that stands for. And then NBIOT. Uh, and that's all from the 3GB <coughs> standards group for, for the cellular. That's over 800 entities that are part of that uh, standards group. So it's, uh, it's sometimes it's a real dogfight in setting the standards. And I'll talk about that more in a moment, the reason why it uh, has, has an impact. So CAT1 or LTE-M uh, is a 
reduced version of 4G technology, instead of being at 20 megahertz of, of space, they reduced it down to 1.4. They're trying to find ways to, to reduce the battery, reduce the, uh, vo the uh, bandwidth that, that, that it provides. And uh, so it normally operates at 200 to 400 kilobits, but it has a max peak rate of 1 meg uh, that it can transfer on, uh, uh, on when needed. As required, and the battery life is anywhere between five to ten years, depending on the, the data model that you're using. So it's ideal for mobile cases. What I was talking about, where you've got a, some some object moving uh, in the world, uh, and in fact, it is so robust or it has so much bandwidth, they're doing LTE voice a uh, voice over LTE uh, with those networks. Uh, AT and AT and T and Verizon have already started implementing their network. They've got systems up with uh, M1, CAT M1 out there uh, in it. Orange, KPN, SK, they all have are in the process of deploying. Tels, uh, Telstra in Australia, Telus and Bell in Canada, and the Swiss Common All, they're planning and, and just now beginning to, to deploy. And Sprint will deploy uh, CAT M1 uh, mid-year, start ne starting next year. Now, the, the brother to the smaller or lower bandwidth uh, uh, brother of that is NV, narrowband IoT. That is, normally standards take 8 to 10 years to create. This one was created in just a little over a year. And the reason why they did that, uh, they had the dogfight going, they had the war going on inside. Huawei has an approach uh, for NV IoT. Ericsson and Note. Uh, Nortel have, or Nokia have an approach uh, for MBT, uh, IoT. To satisfy and get a, a standard out there, they put both protocols inside this one standard. So there's an interoperability problem right now. They think, I believe what, and they're not talking about it, so you have to read real close. Rick Nunn, uh, Nick Hun, is uh, an analyst who has read the spec in detail, and he, he says what they did is they put the Huawei spec in there, which is based, basically based on the Newell and the Weightless W approach, and they put the Nokia um, Ericsson approach in there. And Vodafone is deploying all of the all their network with the Huawei uh, approach. I believe what's going to happen is the chip guys are going to create the chips that when a device comes into a network, it goes, which network am I talking to? Huawei or Ericsson Nortel or, or Nokia? And uh, then it will uh, uh, interact with that network appropriately. The, the issue there is that these chips are always going to be complex and be a little expensive. What the cellular guys have got going for them are economies of scale. So they're going to be all the carriers around the world, these 800 entities that are part of 3GBP. They will uh, enable, um, or will encourage the chip manufacturers to to, to produce and uh, create uh, large volumes and reduce the price. Down. There will always be a need for that kind of system because they've got worldwide coverage. So Mike has an example where he sends stuff uh, uh, on a boat and he doesn't know where it's going to land. He needs to be able to have his device to be able to wake up when he gets to the port and figure out what network is there and log on to it. So those kind of applications will be worthwhile having this kind of complexity and uh, network that has a worldwide coverage. So uh, if you wanted to study the differences between LTE, CAT M1, and NVIOT, uh, you can take a look at the, I'll put the slides up on my uh, LinkedIn profile that you can take a look at. Uh, another analysis of the comparison between the two of them. Uh, they're very similar. NVIOT is supposed to be lower power, but they haven't field tested it yet, so they're not sure exactly how well it's going to work. And in this, uh, with NVIOT, smartphones still have priority. So if there's too much traffic in an area, the smartphones will get priority, and then your NVIOT device will have a chance to talk. So there could be some problems, but they'll figure it out. They, those are sharp guys, smart guys, a lot of money behind them, so they'll work it out. Um, again, a lot of companies are deploying Cat 1. Cat M1 now and we'll do MBIOT following, or they may just wait for MBIOT and, and start. So uh, it's getting some leverage. So, Laura, hi. Hi. So, there's a point of distinction that's worth noting. Um, so, Cat M1 is actually release 13 of the LTE stack, which means for a carrier, it's just a software upgrade. Okay, when you go to MV, when you go to LTE and V, 
okay? There is a hardware upgrade element for a carrier to upgrade the transmission. It is exceptionally costly for a carrier to go um, and deploy uh, LTEMD, which is why we're probably not going to see it in the marketplace until 2019 because there's a tremendous amount of LTE <coughs> towers and carriers that have to be upgraded to facilitate and be along with the chipsets. And with the carriers focusing so heavily currently on 5G, um, that's also distracting them. So, you know, you're, you're seeing, you know, that's also why NB is going to take a while to, to, to come around. But I think it's worth noting to everybody, it's a big architectural difference. But on the flip side, the chip that is a device is actually software. In some cars, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. So if you buy the right chip today, that does LTE and yeah, yeah, CAD M1, um, if it can go to L MB, if the carrier you have has the right you know, stack, stack <coughs> protocol. All right, so most people have heard of Laura. Laura has really done a great job marketing themselves and, and getting out there. And their business model is very different. So Simtech, this is first generation LTE, I'm sorry, first generation LP WAN uh, technology. But Simtech took a spread spectrum technology called SHRP spread spectrum and they, uh, they took it to market very quickly and they added a Mac layer on top of that called Laura WAN. Uh, which is open source, but they kept the intellectual property to themselves for the physical layer. So all the chips have to be, if they're manufactured by somebody else, have to be licensed from Simtech. So, but they've done a great job. They have now created a, the Laura Alliance. They have worldwide presence. They've got support from many different companies and organizations. The Things Network is a, pub, is a private or a public, it's a group of individuals that are putting together a public network that can be shared among people using the Laura technology. So they've done a great job of getting people involved and thinking about uh, ways that uh, low-power WANs can be used to solve problems. Now, the thing about Laura is that they have three different classes. And class A is what's been deployed now that most people know about. And uh, the device then, it only talks when there's an event that happens and, and uh, the device says, I need to report this or send up a signal. I send up a report. So it comes awake and it transmits up and then when it goes to sleep, it has two receive windows that pop open for a few moments to get a confirmation from the base station and the gateway. And if it doesn't, then it transmits again, it transmits and sends up and then uh, listens in for a still. The Laura Alliance is working on enabling a more robust LAN, uh, Laura WAN, uh, the MAC layer, so that it can take advantage of class B and make a more uh, robust system with feedback. In a class B system, when the device has an issue, it wakes up and transmits and then looks for its windows. But periodically it wakes up again to, to receive uh, information from the base station. So with that kind of system, then you can be able to tell the, the, the devices, stay awake, I need to send you some more information than just a confirmation. So in the future, they may have a more robust two-way kind of system. Right now, they're still uh, trying to get there. Now, some companies like uh, Link Labs has created their own MAC layer. So they got a proprietary MAC layer that sits on top of this Simtech uh, physical layer, and they're able now to do that. They don't have, in Europe, there's a thing called duty cycle uh, limit, and the downlink is, is limited. The uh, Link Labs MAC layer does some things to the Laura protocol to get around it, so they don't have those kind of restrictions in Europe. Here we've got different rules, so we're not affected so much by that. Uh, but still, if you need a robust system with high uh, communication feedback kind of system, then you might need to go with someone that has proprietary Mac layer and use the, uh, the Simtech uh, layer below. The Class C version, or Class C device, transmits all the time. And periodically it, it shuts down to see if there's something for it. So you better have a big power supply for a Class C type of device. There's not a lot of applications, but there are some where you want to have that kind of uh, constant transmission capabilities. But you need to have a, a power source behind it. Uh, great follow uh, They've got some security built in. And uh, their business model is that people can buy one base station, 10 bases, 100 or more. 
to solve their particular problem, as opposed to a big nationwide system that might or might not cover your particular area. Uh, the cellular guys, you're only going to get coverage in the LTE uh, coverage area. Engine do. Only wherever they built up their network in Syncfox, same way. So uh, this helps a lot of people that have unique or specific problems that they're trying to solve and to either prove out the case or to build islands. So this is great for campuses and industrial type of applications. So uh, then let me bring it to, uh, to Weightless. Okay, <coughs> Weightless, I started talking about this as the Weightless W, the TV white space uh, about five years ago. It was, Weightless was the result of seven years of research at Ofcom, which is the UK's FCC. Dr. William Webb ran that research organization, <coughs> research, and then he left and created the Weightless Special Interest Group, the SIG group there in England. They came out with Weightless, now we call Weightless W, to work in the TV white space. The problem was very robust, very powerful technology, but only the US and the UK are major companies, countries that have approved uh, transmissions in our TV bands in the unused frequency bands. So they put that on the shelf and said, we'll wait until, until the technology or until the legal guys, uh, the countries catch up. So then they came out with Weightless N, and uh, N-Wave donated their intellectual partner to the special interest group, and then that became the Weightless N standard. And they've been running and gunning with that now for the last several years. That back layer is still available, and it was being uh, looked at and evolved in the SIG group. A company called M2 Communications, M2Com, in Taiwan, heard about this, and that uh, the Weightless N, the SIG group, I was not going to commercialize Weightless W for the reasons I explained. Weightless N was already out there. They said, we have a technology, we have the physical layer of a technology, radio transmission capability that supports <coughs> e-paper. The e-paper are tags that can go on shelves, like in a retail establishment or a warehouse or something. Their radio technology went like 100 uh, meters or so. Uh, but it had the potential of being further if, the, if you added more capabilities to it. M2Com talked to the Weightless SIG and they agreed that M2Com would donate their intellectual property for the physical layer so it becomes an open part of the standard and uh, the Weightless group would add though the MAC layer on top of that that they had done their research on and, and been uh, evolving over those last uh, five years or whatnot. So, in the last year, that uh, weightless Piers and Paul standard, that least stands for Platinum, it was the short range technology. Uh, weightless P was finalized at the end of last year. M2Com created a company called Ubic, and they are manufacturing product based on the weightless P. They had to write all the software, all the firmware, all the protocols to be able to support the hardware that they're producing. So they started at the end of last year. It took them until in the end of August before they could ship out the first equipment. So they shipped me an evaluation kit. I got mine uh, a couple of weeks ago, and, and Prasad Gola, you're here somewhere. Uh, yep, there you are. Yeah, too close, I can see you. Uh, while I was on vacation, uh, unfortunately, I had re already registered my base station to the Ubit Cloud, so you can do a whole lot with it. But I finally got it back, I got a chance to work with it last Friday. So I've set it up here for you guys to look at uh, here in a few moments. Uh, they shipped out 40 evaluation kits to five, con five continents around the world. They've got three proof, proof of concept systems going on right now. I can't tell you who they are, I have to kill you. And uh, if they work out, then they'll go to millions of devices uh, for those things. And they've got seven total that uh, proof of concept systems that they'll uh, have up and working before the end of the year. So they're off and running with a hardware uh, product. So the Weightless P protocol is a narrow band protocol. It's basically 12.5 kilohertz signal. And you can actually string four of them together for 100 kilohertz if the frequency allocation allows you to do that sort of thing. But because it's flexible, you can put this in licensed frequency bands as well that are restricted. Some frequency, license frequencies require narrow band 12.5 kilohertz as the max. So it just depends on where you go. Uh, it's long range and low power, highly scalable. So I'll get uh, into that more in detail. Yeah. So, I hate this as a blue, but high capacity. So one of the key things 
that you need to do is scalability because we're going to have billions of devices coming online here in the next five years or, or so. So with this system, each cell site, because it's, and I'll talk about this more in a moment, but it's, each cell site is very disciplined. It's a synchronized uh, cell site. So every device knows when it can talk. So you don't have collisions. The problem with LoRa, it's a, a LoRa system. LoRa just wakes up and sends, and then waits for its uh, confirmation. If it doesn't get a confirmation, it sends again. Well, as you get more and more devices out there, you're going to have more and more of these retransmissions, more collisions, you're going to have packet loss. With this approach, it's disciplined and synchronized. So every device knows when it can talk and, and receive signals back. And so you don't have this constant retransmission and loss of packets. Well, that allows you then to have, in their protocol, they can have five to 90,000 devices in that cell site, depending on what the data model is. A typical cell site is 50,000 devices that could be there. They also control the power of the remote device and the base station. So as you start reaching your limit of the capacity of this existing first cell site, you reduce the size of it by reducing the power of the base station and each of the remotes that are close to it so they can talk only to this base station. Then you put in other cell sites at 50,000 devices. So you're densifying your network and improving your capacity of your network. So it's a highly scalable system. Pete? So you're basically telling us it's the difference between token ring and ethernet. Is that what you're telling us? You can look at it that way. Yeah, because it's a very disciplined system as opposed to just Aloha just sending it out there and hoping it gets through. Right. Yeah, is, is, there, is there some kind of a, a QoS to your priority queuing for different levels of devices? Yes. There is, this thing is, if you read through the spec, uh, it's an open spec, but you need to join the weightless SIG to be able to get that spec so they can continue to operate to evolve the spec and do interoperability testing. So like $1,400 a year to be a member uh, of the weightless SIG. But you don't, do not pay royalty for any product you produce based on the weightless B. And Ubic is only <coughs> the first of many companies that will be producing the hardware. Um, so uh, it's long range. So Laura has, in radio, you, you define things by a common denominator called DBs. DBM is a, a way to look at the radio signal. And so Laura has a, a radio, we call it a link budget, of 150 DBM. Weightless P has a link budget of 160 dB. So any place Laura will work, the Weightless P, WP protocol will work as well. So they're very similar in that regard. Um, it's low power. They do a lot of, of uh, control of the, it's a very adaptable protocol. So not only is it controlling the power, but it's also looking at the radio environment. So when it receives a signal from the base station, the remote device says, I need to transmit back with a similar protocol, and the protocol can change depending on uh, the environment that it's in. So this device then takes the best approach to send out the lowest power with the shortest time that the transmitter will be up and working. So that, that helps keep uh, to extend the battery power. It's a very highly adaptable uh, system. And if you have equipment that's very deep, it will change its protocol so that it lengthens, it's called it spreading. They spread the signal out and it takes longer. So you're adding latency into the system. But these devices a lot of times don't really care if it takes a second or two for it to get through. When you spread your signal, now you're able to get out of places that normally you would not be able to talk out of or from distances that you normally could talk in from. So it's a, it's a kind of highly adaptable uh, system. It is fully two-way, so if you have devices out there that need to have, and we have all these hacks going on, so you need to be able to upgrade your devices. So with photo, firmware over the air uh, upgrades, this system can support that. So you can do you know, firmware updates, security patches, you can do security, uh, what do you call security uh, uh, key exchanges or replacements, that kind of thing. So it's very good. And then being an open standard, then you're able to uh, build all this equipment royalty free. Oops. <laughs> so if you get into detail, this goes into more detail comparing and whatnot. It's just talking about the capacity that I just talked about. Uh, again, you can look at the slides in more detail uh, later on if you like uh, and see. Um, 
So being very, you know, a science is sought for every, every device as to when it can talk and when it should be receiving information. You can actually page individual devices out there. So if you have a device that you need to do something special to, you can actually pick that out and talk to it. It, and two, can also then talk to the base station uh, on a special basis and, uh, and page and ask for special resources or uh, uh, special things for it to be uh, told. So uh, 5,000 uh, to 90,000 devices in a cell site, depending on the, the data model. Uh, it's very efficient uh, in how it transmits. And uh, uh, as I say, it's organized. So these are all the things that I was just talking about. So I kind of got ahead of myself. But uh, yeah, so uh, you get the idea. So the other thing is that it can not only operate in licensed and unlicensed frequencies, but it can operate in various frequency bands. So the first iteration is for 868 for Europe and the 902-928 yeah, frequency band here in the United States. But it can also go in 169 megahertz, 433, 475, 12, and the 780 frequencies as well. So it's very adaptable. It can go in many different ranges. And it runs a long range. It goes to sleep and, and manages the power very well. Um, it can scale very well, and it's highly reliable. It's a feedback loop, and all of the uh, capabilities of being able to uh, control the, how that network operates. And security was a big deal. I didn't really talk about that very much, but they realized a long time ago that there needed to be high security. So it uses AES-128 and 256 for authentication uh, for encryption, and then it. Uh, the device authenticates against the network, and the network authenticates the device. So it's a two-way kind of authentication, and several other layers as well. And we're talking about ways that blockchain could be used to then uh, create providence for devices. So uh, a lot of possibilities to uh, handle. Uh, two-way, very good. Uh, so that was the, when you order a valuation kit, uh, th then you receive a base station, and this is the European version. It's uh, 14 dB of transmit power, uh, which equates, equates to about to 0.25 milliwatts, or 0.25 watts, uh, 25 milliwatts. And uh, the US version will be coming out here shortly, and it's a full one watt, so that's 30 dB of signal. So you'll be able to get much further range. It will affect your battery, so you'll try to minimize that kind of thing. And that's what I've got set up here, so I'll show it to you guys in a moment. Then here's the specs of the devices. The actual, the the actual radio module is the size of your fingernail. The remote device that I got here is a full working evaluation board. So there's all kinds of internet connections that you can uh, connect to it to create uh, proof of concepts and devices that you want to look at. And then the base station is a development uh, base station as well. They'll have indoor version here shortly. They'll have an outdoor version uh, later next month that they'll start And that's the components that come in. And, and, whatnot. and then uh, these are uh, links that I highly recommend. If you want to learn more, you're welcome to go out there and, and take a look. Uh, Google's awesome, so just do a lot of searching. Uh, if you're interested in the evaluation kit, I don't know if I'll show you this. Yeah, uh, go to the Ubic website, or you can do a search on Jay Wei, W E Y, uh, with Ubic, and uh, he has uh, several uh, YouTube uh, things out there as well. Uh, that uh, can give you an idea, and he's the guy. That, uh, well, the website you can order the website, the uh, evaluation kit from if you like. And that's it. So, any other questions? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So when you log on, when you power up the base yeah. station, yeah, got a question? Hey, Trey. Hello. Hey, how you doing? Sorry, you a question? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. Tom. So let's say I want to, I've got, I'm with Sensors R Us. I have an application in the metropolitan area, right? What's the best, who's going to have the best cost performance? total cost of ownership out of all the things we've talked about. What technology do you think is going to give me the best value for my, for my system? So, 
what kind of range do you need? What kind of capacity is your system requiring? How much quality of service do you need? So do you need a feedback <coughs> loop? Uh, so do you know that you received, that the device has successfully transmitted up all of this information? So those are all the things you have to figure out before you get, before you can go and price all this stuff out and figure out if the carriers are going to give you a better deal or if this is going to give you a better deal or whatever, right? Right. You also yeah. have to figure out if there's a network access to that network. You have to build your own network. You have to build that network. Right, right. Yeah. So do you want to have your own private network? Industrial internet of things, manufacturing plants, uh, staging areas, ports, things that are restricted in their area. More on waitlist P would be excellent for those kind of applications. When you're trying to do a nationwide or a worldwide system, a cellular network would be more what you want to, to get involved in. And uh, Paul. I'm going to kind of try to piggyback on Tom's question, which I think is a pretty good question, but let me put it in another way. We're hearing a lot about radio, power, DBM, and devices, and it's all kind of interesting, but kind of at the end of the day, I look at radio technology, and I look at the dashboard of my car and go, gee, what's better, AM or FM? And if one of them was better, then the other one wouldn't be there, right? So there's just your little textbook example of you can't say without getting to the bottom of this question. So let me flip the question to the other end and say, what are we seeing, and I think it's kind of for everybody, and, uh, is, the, <coughs> is the apps that are driving. And I'll, you mentioned it earlier, and then we've seen parking. It's pretty big. Now that leverages well what we do, which is, you know, concentrated battery energy to last a real long time to send a real short signal with a little cheap device and so on. But that same technology might not work for some other application. Okay, so what are we seeing here? That at the application level, because at the end of the day, no one wants all these nuts and bolts and DPNs and chips and <coughs> devices and gizmos and radio technologies. Don't care. Really, really care about what am I going to be able to see on my screen or on my management console that's going to make my cost better, my revenue higher, my life better in general. What are those things? And then I think that will dictate, or at least influence, which technologies you use to go deploy that. But how about up here at the app level? Sir? How much about that here later? Yeah, I mean, you're right. It's the solution that's going to be the, the thing that makes the difference in how a company operates. It break or break them, depending on the total solution. This is just a component. Right. This is a very important component. I think that's one of the three reasons why Internet of Things hasn't taken off. The connectivity issue has not been solved. There's all these different possible solutions, and none of them are uh, have shown themselves to be the right solution yet. So you still have all these choices. And then you've got uh, uh, concern. There's no success stories out there. So until we get those kind of, of uh, people that are making money and it's, it's reliable, this solution set, then we're not going to adopt one. So it's just a lot of, of uh, waiting until it makes sense and we know that it's going to be successful when we do this. Pete? Yeah, so one comment, you know, and Tom, this is up for you a little bit as well, when, you, when you're selecting the system, you know, the uh, pervasiveness of the chipsets available in the marketplace is very important, right? You know, so, you know, with, in a way, they made their own chipsets, right? So when they go to talk to a marketing solution, you know, they go and they have the chipset available for the solution. However, commercially available, if you go to Arrow, let's say, you know, I think you guys sell stuff, right? Yeah, anyway, so, <laughs> so with regard to that, if you go through their entire catalog and you look at the, uh, the component layers, of, of what's available, you will see a, a preponderance of chipsets available for Sigfox, you'll see a preponderance of chipsets available for LoRa, and you'll see a much smaller subset of chipsets available for Ingenu and for the waitlist standards. So if you're architecting a solution, that's going to be a gaining factor. Okay, did I get that one right? Yeah, I would also say the catalog <laughs> Um, I think Jack, you guys have found probably the same assessment I did. They don't really know what they're doing. That's the from yeah, the mobile world like <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, you know, there's a lot of 
you know, there's an old adage, confusion breeds opportunity, right? So there's a lot of opportunity in the marketplace, but you know, there, there are a lot of things. I mean, you know, Alan and Paul, right? You guys manage, in your ecosystem, you manage the base station and the radios, right? So, you know, but you didn't have, you, you didn't have view blocks or, um, you know, Qualcomm or other people manufacturing your ICs for you. you you actually control that yourself. Yeah, just for the record, all, all of our chips, I talked to Terry about this the other day, using arrow. Uh, I'm buying one of the chips on Vinci Key and I have them on my doorstep tomorrow. I can, okay. go, I can go to Arrow as well, of course, and get them in much better pricing and, and much bigger quantities. Uh, it is all off the shelf components. Oh, totally. What's different about it? <laughs> what's different about it is the software and the firmware that I'm loaded onto it. But again, we have choices to make. We, we, we want to put a Bluetooth radio on this one as well as yeah. that we or should it have a Wi-Fi link in addition to the Bluetooth? I mean, do we do we want to be able to You know, so we have to look at the application side and say, well, what's the application need? Let's just do what what's needed for that. I got a, you know quick set on my front door of my house. I got overhead door. IOT on the back door of my house. I can unlock my doors from right here. I got something else on the pool. I got something else watching this camp in the house and something else running my my, my thermostat. Well, and, but, and, and, and they're uh, different technologies. And, and to the point of the application, everything you just mentioned is so is consumer, right? Because that's that's designed for somebody who's doing it in their house and ultimately really touching the consumer. And then industrial it's B2B, &B, right? But then industrial the other big thing is, it's great if we're talking about base stations and something's fairly static or if it's in a defined geo boundary, right? When stuff like, I know Maria, you're working on stuff that's in a defined geo boundary. It's not necessarily, it might not necessarily be stationary, but it's within a same exact parameter of stationary area. Or it's just buried under the ground. That's the other thing, right? Well, or is it traveling from here? And what Craig was pointing out rightfully so, where we were getting confused is. Am I staying here? Or am I going into Europe or, or you know, Latin America? Or where is this thing that I'm sending going off into ether as well? And so at that point, where what's what's standardized? There's not really a standardization here. Anymore. But it all goes back to defining the requirement. Yes. You can build anything you want, but you have to have very specific requirements from the customer. Well, let's say that's the other gating thing besides communication, which I think Ed, you hit kind of like one of the main sore points is no one's figured out connectivity very well yet, so that's been a big main gating factor. The two other ones I would say are, you know, everyone's trying to build systems, but every customer seems to want something specific to them and them alone, and no one's really shown any interest in adopting a more universal standard, and I think that's been a problem. Um, and on top of that, there's a lot of customers who are like, well, they can make up their minds. Like, we're saying, Paul, do I add Bluetooth? Do I add Wi-Fi? No one can seem to, to actually identify what they want or need, and more importantly, what they need. Um, and then one thing that's commonly overlooked, I think, is batteries. Because uh, there's not really a good supply source for a lot of them. Half my customers go to Amazon because we're not even good batteries. Um, so, I mean, when you can't even get like basic things like that that will power system for years, that's another major factor. But I think connectivity is definitely number one, and then universal adoption. Yeah, standards need to be. The problem is there's too many standards out there. Yeah. <laughs> we need to find some standards that really work and get accepted. There's one standard that works around the world today. Not tomorrow, but today, and that's 2G. Uh, well, that's well, not tomorrow. <laughs> 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 so I have product today in, in 190 countries, and today the only way that's possible is 2G because 3G is not everywhere, 4G is certainly not everywhere, and NBIOT and Blitz and Cap M1 are dreams <laughs> today. That we might have a base station in one city, someplace, some year, <laughs> this year. Now, I'm a little exaggeration there, but but not far. I can't go take a Cat One M device and uh, Cat M One device and go to Oregon and Florida and Dallas. But there's a high price. unless there's a trade show on IoT in Florida <laughs> where the people from Verizon show up 
a week ahead to make sure that base station is ready. <laughs> they don't look like a fool in the trade show. But, but, there, but, there's, a high, but there's a high likelihood that at and Verizon, before they completely sunset their products, are going to get the, cost, the software upgrade. <laughs> right. So I, I'm, I'm happy. The highlight but but AT&T and Verizon are such small players in the overall universe. I mean, they're little guys. They're, they're the two little guys that have to service a little small country called the US. I got products that are in 190 countries. I can't rely on this one. If, if I lose 2G in America, my customer's business says, yeah, there's a few containers that come and go for the United States, but it's just a minor disconnect. I'm exaggerating, but not far, because US is just one country. With a few boats to come in. <laughs> <laughs> I can't afford to go to, wow. I can't go to the M M1 now because, well, for a lot of reasons, but nobody has it. But, you know, one of the things that's really problematic about the 2G going away is, and I'm really sad that the Verizon guy left, right? You know, he saw this coming. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, right. So, with regard to that, you know, most specifically, Verizon is sunsetting CDMA, right? Which is, you know, which is hugely problematic because obviously then everything is forced to, you know, if you had a CDMA chipset in there, you have no, nothing but an upgrade battery, two Cat one M. So Verizon, most specifically, as compared to all other carriers, well, like Sprint goes to the number four, um, you know, has to make this happen. They have to be in the United States. Verizon must make Cat 1M work. You know, NV is not coming out until 2019 at the very most, at the very least. And, and Cat M1 has to be upgraded on the Verizon network, you know, with regard to that. And on the ATT, obviously, with, especially with FirstNet, is going to be forced to do all the upgrades as well. So, I mean, I think with a great level of surety, Cat 1M will be, you know, pervasive by the shoe. Yeah, yeah. so we'll be making upgrades to the product. Right now our product, this particular product is disposable, so we have the luxury of as long as I have six months six months notice of when two G's gonna go with the treated in the US June. Yeah. Then um, uh, then I'm then I'm good. Yeah. So so what's gonna drive consolidation? That's a question I have, right? Because it looks like every three months there's some new extension for, for Laura that somebody comes out with something more proprietary or CND. I mean, I don't see us actually moving towards any consolidation. It actually seems to be getting worse every quarter when I take a look well, at you know, it. It's really, it's really interesting in the market for a place, right? Because there are a lot of people making bets. You know, the, um, you know. Yeah, but it's a roulette wheel, not blackjack, man. I mean, it's getting yeah, yeah, yeah. scary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, if you look at, if you look at like, you know, who's building national networks, so Ed talked about Senate, Senate's building a national network. Um, there, there's a, a rumor around there that they run out of money. Um, you know, Ingenue is building a national grid network. There's a, there's a rumor that they run out of money, which is why John Horn got fired. Um, and you know, Ed. What? Yeah, well, <laughs> his massive okay. salary. So six, six, bucks, six bucks has raised three hundred million dollars, and they've run through it. Okay, and um, if you look at the other national, you know the other things, right? So Microsoft has a white space initiative going on, right? You know, in in, in you know, to provide rural broadband connectivity, right? Which is you know interesting. Uh, but I think that they're no that's their response to Google, right? And uh, Comcast with Machine Q is setting up a national LoRa network. However, they're only on, they're going to operate in their you know cities where they have you know a you know triple play or quad play services, and B where they uh, they're going to bundle it in with their national Wi-Fi deployments. Right, because they are the largest hotspot employer in the United States. So I don't know, have you looked at the machine TV stuff yet, Ed? No, I haven't looked at it in detail. Yeah, yeah so um, so with regard, and they're Laura. Okay, so you know, just just to, just to throw it out there, right? So you know, those are those are the you know the people the people you know betting. You know, those are those are those are the bets. Nobody has jumped on the build the national waitlist network. You know, yet in the United States. 
I think it's definitely the dark horse yeah. behind yeah. the curve. I mean, there are good things and bad things here. We always had some architectural benefits. The, the problem, I made the, I, I made the token ring Ethernet, um, you know, com comment purposefully when I said it, right? So we all know, that this, uh, people of an age like me, know that architecturally token ring was a superior technology to Ethernet. And we all know that it's a win. That was also beta VHS. Yeah, I would say the same thing. That was also beta VHS, my friend. So let me point out, it's 9 o'clock now, so if you need to go, you're welcome to go. But we're here until 10.30, so we can have room till then. So you're welcome to network and, and continue on.